Okay, hi, very good evening. Uh, warm welcome to this. I'm feeling a little bit tired today somehow. Got a pain on the right, left, and right hand side. I don't know. So yeah, very good morning, uh, good evening, Zuba. Warm welcome. Good evening. So uh, what I would do today is that I would cover up the rest of the portion which we are learning. So we learned the manifold part, right? And we'll also learn why manifold is important. What is the importance of manifold? We already saw one of the books. And as we have spoken that we already saw that we should start with smooth manifold and uh, not with the differential manifold and uh, uh, subsequently so on. And we saw that I, why uh, this uh, manifold are important because it leads to a very foundation and important learning in terms of general relativity. So we will start with what is called the curves and surfaces. I'm just skipping over these parts a little bit quickly because we have already gone through that. Dhruva was asking very interesting questions also. Uh, differential manifold, smooth manifold, these things are already done. I will cover up a Lorentz metric uh, later up because it will require some mathematical equations which I need to type it out. And uh, so that's out. Okay. So we will start with, curve, oh, I think we have done with this, right? Curves and surfaces. Yeah. We have done with these two books and uh, world is out of nothing, geometry through history. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was talking, okay. Uh, we have talked about this book also, part one, part two, and we read about the important part of the definition. Oh, okay, here is another book, which I would like to show you, Geometry Illuminated. Okay, this is uh, again a very, very good book. I would like to uh, really suggest to all of you. The reason why I'm suggesting you this book, uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, let me show you how this book is arranged. So you see the book has got, first of all, uh, the development of distance function. That is what is called the deed kind cut. This is important, right? Then it will go into development of the pseudo uh, sphere model for hyperbolic geometry uh, that develops to multivariable calculus. Remember, remember this is a very th thick fad book. Okay, and it would cover up, as I told you, any book won't assume you anything. It will cover up everything one by one. So it will do that. Then it will go to the equations of inversions, hyperbolic geometry. Uh, uh, what I would try to tell all of you is that, yeah, physics core, very good evening. So what I would like to tell you that uh, in any kind of a, Curvature, I mean to say, uh, it should go the other way around. I mean to say, you should first learn the curvature and then go to manifold. Anyway, we learn the manifold part that you can change. But, uh, you know, the good part is that whenever you are learning any book on curvature, you will see that it will essentially start with hyperbolic geometry and then move to the other parts. Now, it should not happen to all of you. Let me tell you that during that learning of curvature, you don't know this, you don't know this mathematics, you don't know complex number, you don't know partial derivatives. It should not happen. So even prior to that, if you want me to talk on what is the mathematics required for curvature, I would like to tell to you, uh, partial derivatives would be a very important idea. I mean, so absolutely, um, I, you don't need to derive big uh, mathematics, but have a good understanding of partial derivatives. There are some very good books on partial derivatives that takes you step by step and complex numbers along with linear algebra and vector calculus. So uh, what I'm trying to tell you, I hope you understand that when you start learning curves and surfaces, you should not feel, oh, oh I don't know derivatives. Oh, oh I again have to go to complex numbers. No. So I always tell that the basic mathematical foundation has to be strong. And then here you see that it will go to multivariable calculus that is differential equations next what the book does is this part one you see natural geometry so it would start with uh, sorry neutral geometry neutral geometry means congruence distance lengths angles the euclidean geometry in that way sometimes it is called neutral geometry then it will tell with euclidean geometry like axiom circumference con uh, concurrence then so you see part three, which is very important. It is going to Euclidean transformation. So beautiful, isn't it? That first it teaches you about the neutral geometry. Then it teaches you about the Euclidean geometry. And then it shows how the Euclidean geometry gets transformed. Transformed into what? Non-Euclidean geometry. Okay. So analytic geometry, isometries, reflections, all those things. I mean to say you are 
uh, transferring the Euclidean to non-Euclidean. And the part four will teach you about hyperbolic geometry, hyperbolic reflections, hyperbolic trigonometry. It is a super wonderful book. I, I, I can tell you this much. I will come tomorrow with a very big surprise, a different kind of a class. You are all going to enjoy. It won't be on mathematics. It won't be on physics. If anybody can guess, can put it, but I would rather keep it as a surprise. So what I'm trying to tell is that this is an ideally ideal book. It will start absolutely that the sum of the angles of a triangle is equal to 180 degree. Then it would build upon the base. Then would show that, okay, you got the base. Now how I can transfer it to non-Euclidean geometry. And then it takes up the hyperbolic geometry. So ideally, it, I would say this is one of the best book. Although this book is also good. I mean to say this one, which I talked to you earlier. This, this book. This book is equally good. Tools and insight to introduce students to modern. So I would request all of you that the understanding of the Euclidean, Euclidean all you know, otherwise you won't be able to take up non-Euclidean. Be very sure on that. So if you are taking from a jump from Euclidean to non-Euclidean, I mean to say going into relativity, differential geometry, etc., this transition phase is very important. Are you getting my point? I mean to say how the modifications of the basic school level geometry is getting transferred into non-Euclidean geometry. This phase of transition, how things are changing. Because once you understand that change, then building up on the hyperbolic, then elliptical geometry, then manifolds, etc. will become easier. But if you don't understand this transfer, I mean to say how this, uh, how would I make it, how, how it would how it will make a transition from this to this, that becomes a difficult. And both these books teaches you that. This one also teaches you about all those parts. And this book also, the, this one, Matthew Harvey's uh, Illuminated, Geometry Illuminated, this one. So as I see the sequence of study, Gaussian, Gaussian coordinates, transfer. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think... Sumit, you're right on the track. So what Sumit is telling, I mean to say, these are actually the transfers which are happening. Okay. So that is why you see in the sequence of study, I have actually mentioned first this book and then the, the second book. Now wait on. The surprise is yet to come. This would be another ideal book for curves and surfaces. Please discuss intuitive transfer. Uh, intuitive transfer means I cannot get it, Sumit. If you can just put it in chat. You mean to say, are, are you are you thinking, are, are you asking me that how mentally you would transfer yourself from a three dimension to four dimension or higher dimensions? That is what you are asking. I will wait for Sumit's answer. Now, this is another very good book by Francesca Tovena and Marco Abat. And uh, this is a wonderful book about uh, curves and surfaces. Now, I would like to tell you uh, a very unique feature of this book. Here you see, it says that we do not require you to have been exposed to algebraic topology in particular if you do not have any idea of what we are, uh, a complete introduction to the theory of degree or continuous maths, etc., etc. That means the because we are moving into uh, curves and services, so it might happen that there is a need to understand algebraic topology. But it is clearly mentioned that the author does not expect you to know about algebraic topology. Further, you will see this is also a great book which is called Curved Spaces. This is by Professor Pelham Wilson. And I would like to show you a few snippets of this. this these are uh, So it starts again. You see, every single book of curvature, if you have seen the first book, the second, except the historical books, all of these are starting with Euclidean geometry. Then it is moving to spherical geometry, triangulation and Euler numbers, and then moving to hyperbolic geometry, taking into account Riemannian metric. So this is very, very important. Then further, it goes into this. Smooth and embedded surfaces. We talk about smooth manifolds, etc. Then geodesics and abstract surfaces and Gauss's bonnet theorem. Okay. 
This is an excellent introduction to the field of differential geometry and as a wonderful self-contained exposition of undergraduate geometry. So this actually takes into account what we call is the, uh, I mean to say in terms of books, what it would be. And now I will come to the part that if we learn those curvatures and surfaces, what is the advantage that we are going to get in terms of differential geometry? So now we move a little bit into the physics part. And I would like to explain this using my Jamboard because I have to show you uh, certain things uh, which would be quite interesting. Right. So here you see what is called is the famous Einstein field equations. Although you might see something, uh, I mean to say different, uh, different in the sense if I go to the reduced version of Einstein's field equation, you might see something like this also. It, will, it just takes a little bit of time, you know, to copy and paste it. But yeah, so you can see something like this also. So this is actually what you see over here. It is a kind of a, a I would say, a reduced version. So this G mu nu component is basically nothing but this entire part has been taken into this. This is reduced to this and the rest of the things remains the same. However, for the learning purpose of ours, I would say, let us take this part, not this part. So otherwise... You won't be first let us understand each of these components and how we expand on that otherwise it becomes a problem that first we learn the reduced portion and we really do not know what is an einstein tensor etc so that becomes a problem okay so i would like to delete this part and i would use this this particular part now you see that in this part of an equation i mean to say this is a set of equations we called it Einstein's field equations, not uh, equation, but we see a single equation, right? We say it as Einstein field equations. Okay, but the question is that because we are seeing only one equation, there are certain other equations which are hidden. There are certain other equations which are hidden. So the question is that where it is and how to deal with that. Now, first, before going into this part, I first have what I would like to explain over here is that if you take any equation, for example, uh, just a second, uh, I, if I take a sim simple kind of a, uh, a mathematical equation, which is a straight line, say if I take y equals to mx plus c, right? I'm improving my handwriting day by day using my mouse. <laughs> So y equals to ms, mx plus c. So any kind of equation you see right over here, what it discusses is that it tells you on the left-hand side there is something, on the right-hand side there is something, and these two equations have to equate. Putting this value will show something, putting this value will show something. So either way it has to match. So the Einstein field equation also tells you the same thing, which is what will match with what. I will come to those, uh, you know, fields, equations and the details much later. But let us understand that this is what the equation, just like a standard equation, it is all about. Now, first, I would like to tell about the left hand side. There, so there are two, two things, the left hand side and the right hand side. So first, I will take the left hand side. Now, this we know that we have learned using what is called the curves and the curvatures, right? So I would take this down and this is, I would say, measures that means the left hand side the left hand side measures the curvature of space time okay i will explain you each and every component so be there this is going to be a very interesting and an informative lecture so what what it does it actually measures the curvature of space time that means, say for example, if I take a very simple intuitive understanding, if I take a kind of a curve like this, that means how much it is curved. Is it curved in this way or it is curved maybe in this way? Whatever, how much it is curved, it will tell me that, the left-hand side, okay? That means there is an equal to, remember. That means it should be equal. It's not that it is not equal to. And the right-hand side, this part, I would say, what does it tell? It is also a kind of a tool. It tells, I would say, it measures what or, I would say, what or how much matter 
is present or uh, is responsible let us put it a better english is responsible responsible for the curvature i i, I mean to say this is a little bit elaborative definition but for the learning purpose this is good then we will make it short so it tells that it measures that how much matter is responsible for the space time curvature that means if it is an elephant which causes the curvature obviously it would be more or is it me or anybody else or a flower or a pot what 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 type of matter is present in order to cause that curvature right and these two are equated that means the amount of matter present will be equal to the space time curvature that means the the, the tensor components on the left hand side what it measures should be equal to the right hand side equally the right hand side should be equal to the left hand side now this is very important because the curvature measurement should be equal to the curvature that is being caused and also the curvature that is being caused due to the presence of matter will be equal to the measurement of the curvature obviously that means if the curvature is k1 it cannot be that the measurement of matter is k7 okay i hope i am being able to clear and if it is k7 the matter is uh, say for k7 the curvature has to be equal to k7 or c7 say for example so it it, it, it should not happen that they are not matching with each other that is why it tells that space time tells matter how to move and matter tells space time how to curve this is very central before going into uh, einstein's field equation you should understand this this one is telling that how to move and that is also telling how to curve so both of them are equally responsible for each other okay fine so it is this is this is this is what the equation is telling about i, I will carry the equation in the next jam board and first of all <clears throat> what i'm going to do is that i will going to tell you few things which you already know okay just a quick question are is my audio and this graph uh, sorry the jam board all of them are visible because i am not checking it in my mobile just over there sumit and others who are watching can you tell me that is it all okay you are being able to hear the views are uh, the it is visible and you are enjoying this can you just uh, let me know in the chat box i would feel more than happy uh so what first of all i am going to do is that i am going to take those things which you already know okay dhruva is saying yes okay great so all of you are you are enjoying great okay great this type of response from time to time if you give me i feel better because i cannot see you i cannot hear you all is that i can see my face and things are going on okay so first of all you need you already know what is our half i don't need to measure you already know what is capital lambda that is called the cosmological constant you already know what is 8 pi that is also known to you i mean to say constant you know this is gravitational constant and you know what is c4 what is c4 speed of light sujoy okay thank you what is c4 speed of light don't ask me why it is c4 i will come to that later one by one because we are taking one of the remember sujoy yes please can you break down each term in this nonlinear equation matrix yeah 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 i will do that space flight that is the objective of the lecture in a series of lecture we are coming to that so don't worry that is basic objective so absolutely it will be done uh, only thing is that uh, uh, what i was I, i i forgot anyway so what i am trying to tell you is that oh yeah i was trying to that let us understand that we are reading and learning one of the toughest physics and toughest mathematics remember so it is no joke and i all welcome you to this session okay c4 Uh, i will later tell you why it is speed of light is raised to the power 4 because uh, that is what is called uh, dimension and analysis in terms of the dimension because we know we have got uh, you know four dimensions so that is why uh, in we, we call it as c4 i will come to that if you, if you want to know like i mean to say what is the 8 pi uh, also i would say 8 pi uh, it comes actually from the poisson's equation i will also deal with it a little bit later so that actually uh, you know comes from uh, the 8 pi actually the area of a sphere anyway i will come to that part 
actually it takes place from the uh, you know four pi part and then it goes to the newton's gravitational potential and then it takes a sphere anyway i will come to that part later okay fine so we know this constants right so nothing to worry about we know this constant we will do it with that now what is important in all those constant is the good old gravitational constant which is g now you might have watched my earlier videos in the live lectures etc i have told that the geodesic equation we have to be patient i think teachers always have a plan oh mr thomas oh uh, uh, i i don't know if i'm pronouncing you in a wrong way uh, i think you're jo joining from germany uh, i you have already commented a warm welcome to you uh, mr thomas i think you're joining from uh, I forgot the name. You told me there is something which I need to change. Yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining from Germany. Okay, so what I what is important, what I'm trying to tell is this G part. Now, if you remember my earlier lectures, I have told that we cannot ignore Newton's laws of motion because the geodesic equation is coming from the Newton's second law. <coughs> That is what is called the uh, acceleration as a second derivative of time, etc. So you see that even disregarding all the Newton's laws of motion, Einstein's field equation shows G. So that means the constant, obviously, if it's a constant, we have to take it. But under weak field approximation, we will see that it reduces back to Newton's law. You know, it's so beautiful. I mean, to say, if you can think, it is something like a... A child is being born, okay, and oh, I pronounced this perfectly. That is Thomas Huth. Okay, so it is something like a child is born becoming an adult, but an adult should not forget that he was a child. So if he reverse back, the child goes back to the uh, mother's womb and become, uh, the adult goes back to the mother's womb and become a child, right? And I remember it was Madonna's song. Return to Innocence or Michael Jackson, where it was shown in animation that everybody is going back and the uh, and the old person is also going back to her, his or her mother's womb. I think Return to Innocence. I remember it's a very ph philosophical song. Anyway, okay, so where do, we, uh, uh, where do we stand? So this gravitational constant is there. Okay, now first of all, what I would like to uh, have a kind of an understanding is some of these factors. First of all, we need to understand one thing that in this entire equation there are certain things which are repeating first of all we will see this mu nu is repeating this mu nu is repeating this mu nu is repeating and this mu nu is repeating okay and if i draw a kind of a coordinate system in general in a cartesian i will draw it in cartesian but remember it is all a four dimension space uh, space time so this would be x y and z, I mean to say spatial dimension, and we take the temporal dimension as time. This has been actually to visualize it, it is a space time continuum. So I measure it what? A space, sorry, space time continuum. It's called a space time continuum. But for the sake of imagination, I think we can imagine it as a Cartesian coordinate. Now, uh, what we also need to know this mu nu are actually dimensions. So this is four dimension. I mean to say this one, x, y, z, and t. This one is x, y, z, and t. This one is x, y, z, and t. And this one is x, y, z, and t. Okay. Now you see, I will try to give you a very wonderful thing. So four plus four plus four plus four, all of them are four. How much it comes? It comes to 16. That means we can say, it is a set of, oh, sorry, 16 partial nonlinear uh, differential equations. Okay. Now you see here, already we got our answer and you did yourself. I have done nothing. What it tells that it is a collection of 16 partial nonlinear differential equation, 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4. So that is why you now got the answer that why it is called Einstein's field equations, not an equation. So <coughs> 16 equations taken together in one single line, left-hand side equals to right-hand side. 
we will also explore soon that these 16 equations we don't need to study all the 16 equations we can reduce six equations which are a kind of a duplicate it would be wrong to tell duplicate i would say they are symmetric in nature and we will only study 10 equations but you have to be patient on that as thomas huth rightly told that every teacher has a plan this part is all clear you can just put me a thumbs up whether you're getting this point or not right okay so we need move on to the next slide consider this to be a board we can move around from year to year i don't have a wide board which i have in my college <laughs> so, okay so this is uh, you know something okay fine now you see the basic question rises that why i am using all those mu nu in this r and g and g and t why not in this uh, um, half why not near lambda why not near g okay that is a question i mean to say you should ask me that uh, why i am using mu nu only in this uh, i would say exponentials why not here why not in lambda okay so to answer this question as i need to tell you is that what are those components are okay so i would go back to my uh, slide which would be i think easier where is my slide oh yeah so here you see i am not repeating this is again the same thing this is the einstein field equation the constants etc now here you see first of all let me explain you what are the things actually they are we will come to those terminologies don't worry we will explore each and every and we will dissect them to understand okay uh, first of all i'm so sorry let me remove this one this doesn't make any sense so first of all you see this particular part i mean to say the first r this first r this one is called the ricci curvature tensor okay ricci curvature tensor this is the first thing that we are encountering and uh, this is named after this person gregorio ricci curvastro uh, italian mathematician who actually uh, you know made a very significant contribution in terms of uh, what you called a differential geometry so it is named after basically him this person ricci curvature tensor the first one is called the ricci curvature tensor don't ask me why it is i will explain you remember again we have to go slowly because these are not so easy the second r okay we 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 will come to that half is basically a derivation and come to that this second r this one is called a scalar oh what is happening it's called scalar curvature or ricci curvature ricci scalar curvature ricci scalar we should call it ricci scalar again named after this gentleman this one this this r the second one we know lambda i will explain you a little while this is called this g is called the metric tensor which one this g don't confuse it with the gravitational acceleration g that is different so this one is a metric tensor and this one is the ricci scalar and this one is the ricci curvature tensor okay now and there is one thing which is hiding i will tell you later first let me explain the what is visible this t sorry this t is called the stress energy momentum tensor okay this is the stress energy momentum tensor this one so so what we see is that these are all tensor tensor components i'm going to say tensorial components now this part remember the stress energy momentum tensor let me highlight it in a different color so that you can understand this stress energy momentum tensor is actually the classical stress tensor okay it is actually the classical tell stress tensor which is extended using all those things i will i will come come to that later okay now coming to the question is that why these mu nu are all near this because as you understand all of this measures something ricci curvature tensor measures a kind of a curvature scalar curvature measures a kind of a curvature metric tensor also measures something stress tensor also measures something now the question is that as i told you here that these all are measurements and these measurements are what all in dimensions 4 4 4 4 
So if I am doing a kind of a measurement, if I'm doing a kind of a measurement, obviously that measurement has to have a space and a time direction. And obviously gravitational constant or eight pi or C or lambda or one half cannot have any dimensional analysis. I mean to say these are constants, right? So you got the answer that why the mu nu are, behind, are all on the lower indices. This is called co contra I will come to that, are in the lower indices of those exponents, which are basically, uh, I would say what, uh, those who are, who are measuring something. So because they are all measuring all those things, so here you see that the Ricci tensor and the Ricci scalar metric tensor, all of those come into being. Uh, what I will do is that I will take a pause. Uh, I will take a pause. Uh, what is happening? Uh, remove. Yeah. So what I will do? I will take a pause today. So I have explored the basic components. Uh, as I told you that I have a little uh, restriction in terms of the hours of Streamyard. Uh, I, I I ask for a help that if somebody knows what is an o OBS, do let me know. So tomorrow. On the same time, 9.15, I'm going to come. And now I'm going to, then tomorrow I'm going to explore about each of those components as space flight has told that this metric tensor, etc., needs to be done. And I'm going to do it in a very, uh, I would say, deep manner. Each and everything will become so clear to you that you will play around with Einstein field equation. I can promise you this. You can really play around. I mean to say, nobody can make a fool and nobody can, uh, what I would say, you can challenge anybody. I mean to say, I will make you that prepared. Each and every things will be so clear. And that is why I'm taking a step-by-step -step approach. You might say that why I'm not doing all because we have to take a step approach. Sometimes I have to go back. So till now, what we have understood, all the books are cleared. The manifold concept of books are cleared. The curves and surfaces, the books are cleared. How will we study? We know what is the Smooth manifold, differential manifold, that also we know. Now we are dealing with the Einstein field equation. Remember, this will take time because maybe when I'm teaching metric tense, I have to go back and back, maybe three, four uh, things that I have to teach and come back to metric tensor. Because otherwise, you cannot go very deep into this understanding. And I promise you, if you attend these lectures, I will make you understand that you can become so easy, just like algebra. I can assure you this much. So thank you very much for watching this. Uh, and do uh, nobody is putting up any comment on the videos. So I would request Shujoy and Sumit and uh, Mr. Thomas Huth uh, joining from Germany to let me know how things are going. And please do share so that people come to know and they get enlightened with the knowledge of science and mathematics. On Sunday, Dr. Sudeshna Ganguly from Fermilab would be joining with us on this channel at 8 p.m. to talk about particle physics and you're all, you're all welcome to ask questions and learn more and more about particle physics. Also, a surprise coming up in December, somebody is coming to talk on quantum computing, data science and artificial intelligence. I will make the announcement soon. So I'm working on those things. Tomorrow, we will explore Einstein field equation, taking each and each one by one approach. Space flight flare, is saying amazing sir thank you very much nothing will be possible without you all because you made this channel grow you are participating you are coming you see i've got a uh, you've got a pain around this gland i don't know why i took a medicine but i told that i need to come because my boys and girls would be my children will be waiting so that is the level of motivation our seven eight hours of work webinars standing on the classes delivering still i do only because of you and i expect nothing but good comments, good appreciation, sharing, and your participation. That's it. So tomorrow we are exploring Einstein's field equation. Amazing flight. Thomas Oth, Sujoy Das, Sumit Sharma. Uh, who else are there? Dhruba, Physics Core, and the entire world. See you soon tomorrow. Don't mess up because we are going to go and dive deep into those equations. Goodbye. Take care.